Well, good morning, everyone. I'm not on. No, a little bit off. Over here. This one. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Stephen Lorenz from L1 Standards and Technology. And I'd like to show sort of a high level and uh, lighthearted, slightly, um, look at uh, radiometry and space based calibration. The outline, uh, I'd start with an, a brief introduction to L1. It's, we're a small tech company and we serve a few communities and outside of that we're not very well known, uh, always. And discuss what everybody, what I consider to be the problem and a couple of solutions. So an overview of L1. Quite often whenever you, you mention the word radiometry or radiometer, or this is what people think about. This is not what we're talking about today. The um, L1 is a small tech company. We're located in Northern Virginia, have about 15, uh, 15 people on staff. Um, been, been in business now for 18 years, so we're a, an old, very slow startup. The, um, my, back, my personal background is I have a PhD in atomic molecular physics, and I spent 12 years at NIST doing, uh, leading the low background infrared calibration facility, which is basically a, a military funded uh, cal lab for uh, interceptors and space-based assets. Uh, um, but 2001, I decided that I was, would like to try life outside the government, and so left NIST, started all one. Our primary product that we serve, that where we serve national laboratories around the world is a cryogenic uh, radiometer. It can either be helium cooled or mechanically cooled, but it operates between three Kelvin and five Kelvin and acts as the optical power standard for actually the majority of the world. Um, many, if not most, of the national labs, certainly the, most of the G20 outside of this uh, NPL contingent, uh, use my instrument as a basis for their standards. Uh, we've also been involved with NASA in a number of ways through the years, and over a very wide range of scales. Um, my first, I uh, have two instruments in orbit, and almost a third until the uh, current uh, uh, political leadership managed to get a mission canceled because it had that dirty C word in it, climate, you know. The, anyway, the first, first is a, uh, a uh, Earth radiation budget uh, climate experiment launched at the Lagrange one point. So it's a million miles from Earth, turns around, looks to the Earth, and takes continuous measurements of the Earth as the Earth slowly spins underneath it. The instrument was weighed about 25 kilos and used 45 watts and was placed on a you know, sort of a Volkswagen sized bus. Next instrument was a 3U CubeSat. And so I've managed to sort of cover, cover the gamut. Uh, you know, we lost a factor of 25 in mass and uh, our payload used, used only about 1.3 watts. Uh, and but, but in that payload, we had mechanisms and there were, there were uh, star trackers in the bus. It was actually a very sophisticated bus. Uh, it was built by um, uh, Blue Canyon Technologies in Colorado. Uh, launched in November of 16, operated successfully for two years, at which time our radio license expired, and NASA said, great job guys, we're shutting you off. The, um, we also had a very interesting run with the radiation budget instrument, which was a, is a major NASA mission that was canceled, uh, where we, we developed a laser pumped integrating sphere system uh, coupled with an electrical substitution radiometer to act as a uh, reference standard for an eight-year mission. Uh, and then we had a little, um, little ra test radiometer that was supposed to be on a, a several suborbital flights, uh, but due to several launch failures of different vendors, it's still in a box at APL. So the problem, and every person in this room has a different definition of what their problem is. 
That's because it's very application, application specific. If you're trying to do climate science, the goal is to do better than 0.1% or 0.03%. Uh, you know, you'll see numbers like 0.3% per decade. Uh, absolute measurements are required. And sometimes it leads to these massive buses where you know, there, there's a billion dollar spacecraft involved, or three billion dollar spacecraft. Uh, however, if you're just trying to count tanker cars on trains, you don't need very much. And so there's, there's a tremendous range. And, but the area I think we can help most at in the, for this community is somewhere in between. Um, so the, the problem as I see it is to how to, how to quickly and efficiently determine the performance characteristics that actually matter to an end user. And do that in a cost-effective way that if you're trying to crank 100 spacecraft through, you know, you don't require two years to get that job done. And historically, ground cal has been very expensive, very slow, very time-consuming. It was always the last thing in everybody's schedule, which meant it always got cut, or at least we descoped in some way every time. Um, now, on-orbit references, you know, such as plaques and lamps and so forth, uh, can be very useful. They also require a huge swap. Uh, they take power, they take mass, and a lot of volume. Uh, and on, for the big spacecraft, people usually spend more money calibrating and characterizing those assets than they did actually building them to start with. And so that even really extends, ex can extend your calibration activity even further. But to me, one of the key things that's missing sort of in this community that really limits what you can do with some of the assets you already have in space is RSR. If you know, if you know your relative spectral response and have that under control, you understand its uncertainty, you actually know where your band edges are, then you can look at a broadband target. Say you have a perfect broadband target. I know a spectral response, I have a perfect plaque, whether it's on the ground or someplace, or somebody launches a you know, 50 meter uh, reflectance for you know, target on orbit and they use the sun as a target. That doesn't do you any good if you don't know your bands. Right? Because the result you see is a product of the spectrum, spe your spectral response, uh, uh, multiplied by the uh, spectrum of the source. Now, this is, this is sort of a silly graph. Obviously, nobody would try to calibrate their instrument looking at something like this. But it's a very complex scene, both in radiance and spectral content, and has the added complication of an atmosphere. So this is not my idea of a good target. Even deserts and Many of the ground targets are complicated to use. Um, and one big complication is you have this, have this messy atmosphere on top. Now, my idea of a perfect cow target looks something like this, or maybe that, or that, <laughs> or that. However, mine, and these are actually RGB, mine would actually be a single wavelength. And so if you have a situation where I, my imager is looking at that and all it sees is 532, nothing else, and I know the intensity, I know the spatial distribution, you can do something with that. But ideally, you don't get just 532. You get any and every spectral line you want or, or band you want at, say, 0.1 nanometer resolution across your full spectrum. And so, how, does, how do national labs, such as NIST and NASA, uh, currently solve ground problems? In the past, forever, and still currently, people use lamps. I hate lamps. The problem with the lamps is the actual spectrum you get out is not talking about just the radiance, but the actual spectrum you get out is a very temperature dependent. It's dependent on the age, the condition, the history of the lamp, and everything. And so if you're trying to actually do a 1% calibration, 
doing it with lamps is, is almost impossible. But I recently saw uh, some results for OLI2, where Ball did, I don't know if I mentioned names or not, it was a public talk at Calcon last in June. Uh, Ball did an amazing job with a very complex, very expensive uh, lamp calibration system. Huge integrating sphere, I don't know how many lamps are in it, 20 or something, so many that you actually have cooling problems without melting the lamp, melting the sphere. Um, and that's the way things were done for a long, long time. Uh, NASA, finally, taking leadership of NIST, uh, has developed in the last few years something called Glamour. And I don't know if Phil's out there or not. Um, uh, he was involved in, in, in some of some of the OLI2 cows. Anyway, the they learned, so they took, they took a laser-based calibration system, shown it at the same, they, they did the full lamp routine, but then they went, swi switched to the laser, lasers, and they learned an enormous amount about o OLI2. There were a lot of, there were surprises, and in the future, you'll have much better data product uh, because of it. Because they actually know they're out of band, and they actually know the bandages, just for a start. Anyway, back to, back to lamps. This, this picture, black and white picture is from 1920, when NIST was located in downtown DC in an old brown brick building. And whenever I joined NIST in 1989, there was a, a um, lamp calibration facility that didn't look much better in color than that right there. Since then, that one's been scrapped and they've rebuilt it, but it still looks very similar. You have a series of high temperature black bodies, you have some lamps, you do a bunch of comparisons, except they've added calibrated detectors that have uh, a scale traceable back to a cryogenic radiometer, and their uncertainties have, have, have shrank tremendously because of that. However, the, the artifact on the side is called an FEL lamp, and that's the primary lamp standard used by national labs around the world. Then, starting in the 80s, lasers started to really take hold in the world. This is a picture from about uh, 1990. Um, and lasers used to be tough. I did my post, my uh, undergrad, sorry, undergraduate graduate work uh, doing optical pumping of atoms and I spent every day fighting with lasers. Um, and so to do a complicated system where you could cover a lot of spectral range took a lot of hardware, and it took some really, uh, I won't say talented, but experienced people to actually make the, keep the things lit and to change wavelengths to do anything useful. And, but that just isn't true anymore. You can now buy systems that you can push a button and it will scan wavelength for you and hold lock over hundreds of nanometers. And so it really has become the sort of thing, you need some expertise and some training, but you don't need two PhDs working full time to keep things actually putting out photons. So the standards lab approach, and that this is true both for NIST and, and NASA, uh, is to basically take a bunch of lasers, light an integrating sphere, why an integrating sphere? Because that gives you a very, it can, if you inject properly, uh, a very spatially uniform target. So now I know the wavelength, and I know the radiance. I know the radiance because I have a heavy, mistraceable radiance meter that is calibrated for that job. Um, and I know the spatial uniformity. This, uh, we've, uh, we've delivered two systems like this that were actually called uh, part of a traveling circus, which went, went around the country. They were used at last in Boulder and at Goddard on and off through the years. I'm not sure where they are right now. Um, they were a small laser table, about four by six feet in size, and packed with, packed with hardware. But with that system, you could cover almost this entire spectral range with ease. And in the, that was about 10 years ago. Well, yeah, 10 years ago now. Um, but it, and the, the lasers have become easier, 
not necessarily any cheaper, but easier to use than they were back then. So the technique is basically you can use an integrating sphere with a tunable laser, have a radiance meter with a traceable scale that you understand is well characterized and behaves. Uh, with that, in a system like this, your uncertainty budget becomes really simple. Um, you're limited not by the source anymore. You're limited by that radiance meter. And we can calibrate that radiance meter at the 0.1% level over very over full spectral range. Then we can do this across the silicon range and the in-gas range, extending gas, getting out to two and a half microns and beyond, becomes the uncertainty start to grow. But they're still small. Um, calibration chain, as I said earlier, is very simple. You have a have a have a reference radi radiance meter. You have a device that measure, measures what laser wavelength, which is really easy. Hand somebody 20K, they hand you a perfect box that gives you, you know, nine digits of precision and a very low uncertainty on that. And you measure the photocurrent from the radiance meter, which you use a high quality, quality transipedance amplifier and a voltmeter, and that's your system. So to do this, the hardware varies depending on what, what the imager is. If you have a you know, two inch uh, collection optic or a 10 inch collect collection optic, the sphere has to grow. You need to be able to present to the, to the imager a uniform scene. So, uh, um, so one of the expensive items is the integrating sphere. It may cost 10,000 for a small one or 150,000 for a one meter one. The, uh, the rest is the tunable laser. Now, one slick thing on the, about this is I can give you uh, the temporal aspect as well. We can hold power on that, that, we can hold the radiant stability on that sphere to 100 part per million for days. It's just not an issue. So we give you wavelength, we give you intensity, and we can rinse and repeat and hit the same points anytime you want. And so you take your telescope and you take a radiance meter and you trade places back and forth. And depending on the setup, you might be able to look, do both simultaneously. Uh, my preference is to put uh, you can put the sphere and uh, the telescope and the radiance meter uh, actually in vacuum. And so you can then do this as a function of temperature uh, for, your, for your hardware. Sometimes it doesn't matter, sometimes it's a huge effect. Um, but we can build this and have built these so that they're vacuum compatible and you can just chuck the whole thing in a TVAC chamber and do the measurement at, at any, uh, any level. Um, move on. So that's for getting the absolute scale and an S, S relative spectral responsivity as well. But to get, um, get the outer band from your filters, we can actually do the end linearity. We can solve both of those with a similar system. Uh, we can get, I'm uh, usually with a much smaller sphere with some with collimating optics in front of it, and that allows us to measure your outer band uh, on the order of 10 to, the minus, 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6. So here's the very complicated uncertainty budget for this experiment. Um, you know, quite often a measurement equation for calibrating a sensor has 50 or 100 terms to it. And by, by getting, by having a single wavelength source of known power and stability, you, all that goes away and collapses. To something with very few terms. And, you know, and th for this one here, this was for a particular customer. Um, you know, we were claiming 0.46% K equals two. Uh, so that's the story for, you know, what I think, believe, the modern approach is for doing a sensor calibration. Now, the, tr the cute thing about this is after you've got that system built, we can collect all that data in just a, just a day, do a very complete characterization. And if you put it in vacuum and do it over temperature and such, maybe a couple of days. Uh, and then if you, so you have 100 of these things, you don't need to collect everything on every one of them. 
so you can do spot checks in you know, a few hours apiece. But, so that's, that's the ground solution. Then you have to get to orbit. And if you build your hardware well, well, you can minimize the space effects. But I'll admit that even bad things happen to good hardware even in space. So, but there, there is an on-orbit reference a reflectance target, but it is a little bit of a fixer-upper. And the, uh, you know, we were taught in grade school that the moon is a constant, right? It goes around, holds the same, you know, it's basically locked to us, we see the same face all the time, and so what could be wrong with it? Well, it is, it is constant in the f that the surface reflection, reflectance is very constant. Barring a major meteorite strike, little ones happen all the time, but they don't, they're, they're down in the noise, they don't matter. Uh, as long as something doesn't really rearrange the face, you know, the thing, the, it's been a, a constant reflector now for probably a billion years. However, the phase change, as you observe with your eye, you know, varies the intensity about by 100%. And there's a more subtle term uh, called libration, which actually has, puts a 5% variation on top of that. This is from, a, this is actually a model, it's not real data. This is done by uh, LRO, a, a, it's a Goddard product. This is um, what you're looking, let's see, we're running about, a, this is 2012 results for the moon, and this is about five seconds per month, so it's somewhat accelerated. And this is what the moon looks like if you set basically at the equator and just watch it go by. It doesn't look very well behaved, right? It's certainly not constant, and it doesn't show just the same, exact same face to us all the time. Moon actually has a, has a slightly non-circular orbit, and it, there's this strange notations and misbehavior. Uh, and however, the cool thing about this is if you get the phase, if you get the phase, you and you don't, you're after a five percent goal, then the libration doesn't matter. The wobble you see, uh, the integrated radiance changes about five percent due to that. Um, how am I doing on time? Oh boy! Um, when he kicks me off. Talk to me later if anybody cares. Um, so basically the, the goal is post-launch you get to orbit and if you simply want to do what NASA and many missions have done in the last 15 years, that pick a phase that you like and stick to it look and catch the moon at that phase over and over and over and over. Well it allowed, uh, I guess these are, these are MODIS and CWIFs, no the CWIFs. Um, the bottom curve, they had a 14% uh, degradation uh, post-launch uh, that they were able to track and you know, pull out to weigh, to weigh sub-percent. And so it, even if you don't know the actual, uh, the absolute reflectance of the moon, just having a stable target and using it in a way that you get a repetitive result is a very useful thing to be doing. Uh, this is a collection of various missions that have looked at the moon, uh, all big NASA programs, and they see the moon differently. And some of this is due to geometry. Uh, depending on how they're looking at the moon, there's a lot of manipulation that goes in from taking that image and correcting it and then trying to put it on the roller scale. So the roller scale, I believe, is good, depending on what wavelength you're at, to 5 to 10 percent. Uh, it's a little better than what you would take away from that chart. Um, so two quick things, if anybody wants to talk to me later, I'd love to, love to discuss it. Um, there are paths to improving the, the, the lunar scale in a hurry. Currently there, there are two activities I know of. There's one out of Langley and to build a lunar radiance meter uh, that's hyperspectral. Uh, that could easily be five or ten years before you see a launch on that. Funding level is pretty low. They're working hard, but money is a problem. Uh, the other one is a NIST effort uh, where they're actually using an ER2 
and a uh, spectrometer, and they've had one flight, results weren't very good, they're fixing things, so we rerun it, but they get very limited data sets. So with uh, a ba basic you know, CubeSat technology, we can build a monochromator system that will give you these results, you know, give you adequate results to, to use the moon at a sub-percent level within about six months. And if you want a really fast one, uh, we can make copies of your spectral bands, build a series of filter radiometers, <laughs> filter radiometers, and fly that even faster. And so that would be a very specific target just for your, your particular needs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think in the interest of time, we need to move to the next speaker. Uh, take questions after the break. Minsu. Right, Minso. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Minso Kim. Um, I work for KBR, which is a contractor to USGS Aeros, which is in Sioux Falls, in the middle of endless cornfield and a bunch of grazing black angus everywhere. <laughs> So my first mystery when I would uh, move to Sioux Falls at about four years ago was how come the beef price is much, much expensive than upstate New York, <laughs> <laughs> where not many uh, cows are there. So, but there's the, I think, world's largest uh, satellite data center. And a lot of people, almost 500 people are living there and working there. Um, so let me start talking about the uncertainty, uncertainty. Uh, I briefly explain why I'm calling it as a total and also propagated uncertainty. So we all know that the initial, let's call it generically level one product, like radiance or TOA reflectance. Um, but the second major effort from there is, of course, atmospheric correction. And then we do like ARD or harmonization, which involves resampling or actually converting the reflectance value itself, depending on sampling, resampling scheme and uh, purpose, harmonization. Yeah. yeah, and also you go through the next derived product level. So at each and every step, you do something. You modify data, you modify numbers, which <coughs> always associate the, some sort of additional uncertainty. So let's briefly talk about the radiance issue. I mean, we have in this room uh, lifetime hardware and Calvary gurus here, but quickly we have uh, available irradiances here over the wavelength and typical reflectance. So uh, more solar photons available there, we got typically lower reflectance and the other way. And do not forget atmospheric reflectance and also sensor and uh, overall optical system transmittance. So everything combined, we, um, we get the photoelectron uncertainty, which converts to signal to noise ratio. And according to Phil yesterday, he said, um, for example, Landsat OLI uh, spec was about 5%, relative 5%, but he's confident to achieving about 3% or something like that. So anyway, that's the story. So we got, let's say, roughly 2, 3, 4% of uncertainty for that uh, from level one. So from there, now we go to the uh, 
latency correction. So what does it say? At, at first level one, we got, for example, one OLI pixel. We have seven, seven bands. And let's say roughly all those sigma values, sigma band one, sigma band two, let's say roughly about 3%. Now then, uh, when you go through atmospheric correction, then the added uncertainty will be much, much bigger, I guarantee you. So, so to get there, to get there, let me briefly start with very easy equations. So you got volume equation here. Then it can be easily, uh, you can calculate derivative. And uh, so the point is, if you know that the length measurement uncertainty, that length measurement uncertainty propagates through this equation, volume equation, and end up to volume uncertainty. So this exact same simple concept will be applied to atmospheric correction. So now for atmospheric correction, you got many, many different uh, uncertainty sources. Of course, aerosol, the biggest, then ozone, water vapor, and pressure, and sensing angles. So they, those individual components propagate through this atmospheric correction equation and end up total, total because they are multiple so individual sources and propagated because it propagates through atmospheric correction equation. That's all there is. But since it's a multivariate problem, so our simple uh, uncertainty will be a variance covariance matrix and this derivative will be Jacobian. So all we need is, first, we have to define proper atmospheric correction equation, which is a governing equation. Second, we have to derive individual Jacobian element. So to get there, let me briefly uh, talk about atmospheric correction. So simply for the sensor like multi-channel sensor like only that's typical. The white curve above is QA reflectance. And if you do the atmospheric correction, you will end up having the green curve, so surface reflectance. But the overall idea is to, to get the surface reflect reflectance from QA reflectance. You have to you know, correct something, adjust something. So how much to adjust, you have to make that decision. And you cannot do it just from, uh, I mean, there's no, no uh, fancy magical way of doing it. You have to refer to the surface, which gives you a hint of how much, how much to, to adjust or something like that. Right? So that's like uh, endlessly circulating problem. So that the way that you, you determine how much to correct, that, that's, the, uh, that's where the art is. And many different methods, like Centocore for Sentinel and LeCirc for OLI, they all have, they're in common because they, all use, uh, they are all based on the radio transfer uh, lookup table based approach. But each individually have different way of estimating that, but we are not going there. It's a, um, so that's an example before essence correction, which is TOAL. And the right side is after. The first one is using B1 band, a coastal blue band for Lancet. So it's strikingly different visually, yes. But majority of the satellite uh, reflective solar data is used for uh, vegetation or agricultural or land surface type of applications. But it's not really relevant, I mean, because the two blue bands and green band is not much like intensively used. But, but there are plenty of other examples that, uh, that matters. So example, TOAL SR in, in terms of spectrum. So I'm trying to just say something here, but I realized that it would be quite challenging. So let me, uh, well, uh, here what I'm saying is there are a lot of uh, factors, as I said, pressure, ozone, water vapor, and all those stuff. But uh, the most dominating factor is is aerosol. So I'm simply comparing a low aerosol case and high aerosol case. Of course, which is higher? Yeah, left is higher. So left has a higher aerosol 
in the atmosphere. Um, as you can see, those uh, dotted line, dotted blue line here, that that uh, that's the the Rayleigh Rayleigh component. So, which is almost identical, right? The average Earth atmosphere is kind of constant. So, the additional contribution from this yellow curve, which is higher aerosol, this almost minimal aerosol, that makes the, the difference of final TOA reflectance, which is white curve, here. So, I mean, that's simply uh, saying that aerosol is the, the most dominating factor. So, let's not argue about it at this moment. And I'll uh, build a problem from there. And I believe majority of you uh, agree on that. So let us let me talk about a little bit of uh, equation, because I have to at least tell you how I get the uncertainty. Of course, I will show some examples in, in the images, right? But so I'll go very, very brief. So eventually, if, we have, if you have this kind of uh, some sort of governing equation, on the, on the left-hand side, you've got surface reflectance for each band. I, I represent the i-th band. And on the right side is a simple uh, formula, analytical formula. It has to be analytical, and also it has to be um, desirable to have a simple enough equations. So obviously, uh, of course, the input will be TOA reflectance at, at wavelength. And then these are the major parameters, aerosol, pressure, blah, blah. But the angle component is important to uh, making an important decision in the uh, scattering component, which is about aerosol and scattering component, not the gas transmittance. But, but uh, modern day systems has extremely accurate uh, determination of those angles. So even though, of course, they are the extremely important variable. Right? If you have solar zenith angle right there or right there, your molecular uh, optical, optical depth is, is extremely high. So, of course, it's very important. But what I'm saying is the uncertainty of measurement uncertainty is extremely low. So let's consider that <coughs> zero. So let's, let's reduce it multidimensional from originally one, two, three, four, five, seven to four, okay? Mm. Yeah. So this will be the Jacobian and variance covariance matrix. So, well, this is a, a, an argu arguable thing, but let's assume covariance is all zero, <laughs> right? Yeah, there are a couple of things we, we may may worth to consider. For example, uh, water vapor and aerosol is kind of interacting in some manner, but the interaction is pretty weak. So that's the only thing. But other parameters are quite, quite independent. So covariance zero is a pretty reasonable assumption, I think. So let's say eventually we, we computed the surface reflectance uncertainty, which is sigma here. Then we might combine it, this thing, which was, Phil said about 3%. And this thing and this newly computed, which is added component from atoms correction. And it gives you the final total uncertainty of the second step. So the actual computation. So the governing equation, this, this is, uh, by the way, if you think this is radio transfer equation, no, this is not radio transfer equation. This is a simple governing equation that models uh, surface reflectance as a simple minimal of parameters. Uh, but the radio transfer equation creates these uh, atmospheric parameters, like gaseous transmittance or scattering transmittance, <coughs> re atmospheric reflectance. Those are computed from complicated uh, radio transfer equation. But the most of the like 6S or Matran, they are actually using very, very simple, simplified way of solving the radius transfer equation. So anyway, so originally this is the typical, as I said, this is not radius transfer equation. This is simple, simple modeling of uh, TOA reflectance. Let's look at the end, end the last equation. So it is 
uh, it has a simple analytical form, and also the, these two, the red row, that's the surface reflectance, right? So we need to rearrange this equation, which is this. So, um, yeah, all we need is to, to come up with that the Jacobian element. So, sorry, I, I go really fast. Well, <laughs> so, so eventually, all these terms has to be a function of, should be uh, expressed as a function of uh, pressure and aerosol and ozone and water vapor. But uh, um, but if you understand the, the uh, atmosphere, Radio transfer lookup table, for example, success or Matran creates those those T's and rows and S's and everything, right? And they are a multi-dimensional lookup table. For example, TS. TS means a downwelling from solar to solar to surface pixel, that path length of uh, scattering transmittance. So it's a function of pressure and solar angle, solar zenith angle, and viewing zenith angle, solar azimuth angle, viewing azimuth angle and aerosol, of course, all those. So th that T is a multi-dimensional lookup table. Right? So it doesn't have any analytical expression of simple formula. So we have to convert that TS as a function of uh, aerosol and, uh, and pressure and something like that. Right? So I'll briefly demonstrate to you how I do it. Because we have to do it before doing those derivatives, which consists of that uh, Jacobian element. So these are simple examples of, for example, the TS. Uh, this is atmospheric reflectance, sorry. These are the TS, for example, this. Yeah, it look a little bit, of course, it's systematic, monotonic, but if you look at it for each and every wavelength, and these are, of course, low aerosol, high aerosol. So if you look at only band by band, they are simply modeled as a simple polynomial. So in this case, I'm using typical, well, third order polynomial fits very well. And for each pressure level, each pressure level, and these are uh, aerosol, and each line is pressure, so you can do it. Then each individual, this uh, polynomial coefficients can be easily modeled into another polynomial. <laughs> so this is possible. So eventually, uh, these are extremely easy. These are just middle school level math and just nothing. And even though this looks complicated, <laughs> trust me, it's a uh, high school level, simple, simple uh, um, calculus. So anyway, so when you do it, now you can eventually compute the uncertainty. As I said, TPU. So let's look at it. But before showing the example, uh, let's focus on this because this is atmospheric correction and associated uncertainty. So the major impact will be on <coughs> short wavelength side, blue one, blue two, and green mostly. So the, the most influencing applicational um, yeah, use will be for, for, for those examples, oceanographic or atmospheric or Surface classifications. So uh, practically, the effect of TPU on longer wavelengths is kind of minimal. For example, uh, all kinds of vegetation indices, it's not really very sensitive to TPU. So you may want to <laughs> really consider about these approaches. But um, uh, in fact, I'm adding more complication to ALD and interoperability. But uh, going forward, I think people's mind is changing quite, quite quickly. I mean, what we are doing routinely, some 10 years ago, we never thought about it, or something like that. So let's see what happens. Um, example, Alta Forrester from, Forest from Brazil. Uh, TOAL, and after atmosphere correction, surface reflectance. Well, let's look at some examples. Um, 
we, we are looking at horizontal profile at the bottom. And for that specific pixel, the center of the uh, hair, crosshair, that's, of course, vegetation. So the top plot, before absence of correction and after absence of correction, right? The typical blue, green, red, and shooting to uh, the infrared. Now, the TPU for each band was computed like that. Uh, sorry about that. That's the uh, typical 10,000 uh, multiplication factor for, for converting from floating point to integer. So 1,000 means 10%, right? 2,000 means 20%. So TPU 20 at uh, blue first, first blue band means actually 0.2%. 0.2%. So it's, of course, quite minimal. It is because, mainly because the atmosphere on that day was quite, quite clear. Very, very small amount of aerosols. But what matters, maybe, maybe, maybe matters will be that the relative term, TPU relative to the surface refraction value itself, then it comes quite striking. Like it can be even 20% of uncertainty, right? Well, mainly because the reflectance value itself is very low, so TPU, whatever we calculate, is relatively becomes very high. And we are looking at the horizontal profile of that, the, the relative term of uncertainty. So the first blue, blue band, coastal blue band, can be easily like 25%. <laughs> and the second blue band, about 15%, something like that. So. The, any application that uses those bands will be um, another example. On that case, uh, we are looking at the soil sample, soil pixel. So this is about the same value, but relatively much lower because soil reflectance is higher. And another example, yeah, I'm looking at this dirty uh, river plume that goes into the ocean and relatively clear uh, inner harbor water. So here you can see like 10%, in this case about 20%. Well, yeah. Now how about, l let's compare a clear, same area, but clear day, hazy day. Uh, that may give you better insight. In this case, before and after, and the aerosol level is like 1.0. This is quite very high aerosol. And in this case, of course, TOA reflectance is very high at the blue, more than 20%. But we have to correct this much. So as a result, you've got like 15% range. And uh, for this pixel, the uh, vegetation pixels, about 20 something range. So remember this number about for uh, soil type of pixels, you got 15%, 10% range. They are 20 to about 15% range. And clear day. In this case, aerosol is almost none, 0 0.05, which means almost practically extremely clear day. Uh, as you can see, this blue TOA reflectance is only about 10%. In this case, uh, relative uncertainty, TPU over SR, is pretty low, pretty low. So you can create a lot of scenarios and <coughs> try to find how this can be really useful for certain, certain uh, applications. So I, I had to do something, so <laughs> I created a, I created a TPU associated to NDVI computation. So previous examples were just generic, but now this example is specific for NDVI. But as I said, it's not going to be very exciting. So yeah, the idea was you can compute NDVI, but you want to know what's the associated uncertainty that I just computed, the NDVI. So you can do it this way because you know this individual uncertainty for each band. Right? So you can compute this way and you can use that additional information. You have a raw NDVI you just calculated, but you can also compute associated an NDVI uncertainty because in the future, probably USGS will provide those uncertainty image, then you can do that.
Now, you have to take advantage of that additional information somehow. Um, yeah, let me just pass and, uh, for example, that's the, uh, an image, surface reflectance image and AOT level, and this is showing the uh, uncertainty for band by band, blue band, blue one band, blue two, and green band, such like that. So as you can see, the more information, I mean, largest variation of data is here in the shorter wavelength. And uh, eventually, if you, this is TPU, that's the NDVI image computed from that surface reflectance. Oops. <laughs> yeah, that's a relative. So you, you compute the NDVI, like the horizontal profile of roughly 0 0.68 range, and then relatively your the TPU associ associated to NDVI computation will be like just about 1%. That's clear there. So if you have a uh, hazy day, your your number will be kind of 2%, 2.4, something like that. Well, it's just one example. So, um, again, okay, thank you. The idea is we have uh, this seven band only image. Now, in the future, in the future, this technique evolves and refined. You have pretty reliable almost same set of uncertainty image, which will be seven band, and each and every pixel will have its own uncertainty values, right? Then the, in many, many applicational area, this additional information will be utilized. But so far, um, I'm not very deep into it, so uh, I have a limitation to make a nice, fancy demonstration on that, but it's probably a lot of people here can utilize it later. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Minso. Uh, we'll need to wait with the questions to after the break. Until the break. So next up is Joshua Greenberg from Planet. Thank you. Yes, I've never worn one of these before. Is it, am I audible? Yeah, great. great, thank you. Uh, so I'm Josh Greenberg. I'm from Planet and I do radiometry there. Uh, and I started out mostly as a software developer, but I've moved on to learning some of the science I'm trying to improve in this area. So I'm going to talk about um, a cross-calibration comparison between planets new flock of satellites, Dove-R, and Sentinel-2. And I've performed this over farmland. And this is a, a slide that you may have seen before. We have a number of different um, types of satellites at planet. And the one on the far right there, Davar, those are the ones I'm going to concentrate on in this study. Um, and these are the, the ones that were launched at the end of 2018. And so we have imagery starting around December through to present. There's sun synchronous orbit, just like Sentinel-2. So currently, we. Um, radiometrically calibrate these using crossovers with RapidEye, which is itself relatively well calibrated. And these crossovers 
we restrict them to specific calibration sites, um, desert zero invariant sites. But um, this is a little bit limiting in terms of characterization of the behavior of the imagery in a lot of the regimes that um, our customers would be interested in, such as agriculture, um, where one is generally <clears throat> hard pressed to find a zero invariant site. So the bottom line is Planet has to understand the behavior of our agricultural data so we can communicate it to customers. And, um, and we need to be clear about the magnitude of the discrepancies between our data and other major satellites' data across all regimes, not just you know, the specific ones that were useful to us when we were calibrating. And when I say regimes there, I'm referring to positions in the dynamic range, different land cover, uh, different, um, different uh, atmospheric regimes. I have some notes for a second. So as I mentioned, in this study, I'm comparing DOVR satellites, of which there are 25, to uh, the Sentinel 2A and 2B. I have put up um, the relative spectral responses for Sentinel 2A. 2B is very similar. And I've indicated that I am comparing Dove R's near band, that is the, the rightmost um, the rightmost peak on the top graph, to Sentinel 2A's B8, which um, we're, I'm doing this for historical reasons. It's, it's what we've been doing previously in comparisons, although B8A may be a much better comparison for Davar. That's the, the narrower spike, um, the rightmost peak on the Sentinel 2A. So future, in the future, I'm going to see how well it does to compare to Sentinel 2's B8A. So um, to decide where the crossovers should be located, I'm using um, the USDA's cropland data layer, which is a free um, raster-based land cover classification that with 30 meters resolution, and it tells you for each pixel, you know, is it corn? Is it grapes? It gives you uh, um, confidence for those pixels. I have not made use of the confidence yet. But um, this is an incredible resource. And it's free. It's available most recently for the 2018 year. And it also has an amazing website, which I really appreciate. So there's this website called Cropscape, where you can go, you can draw an AOI on the United States, and then it will just let you download the raster in the projection of your choice. So the infrastructure that we use to find crossovers between um, Planet satellites and other satellites requires a polygon AOI. And when I say crossover, I mean that there was a coincidence of the image swaths within, say, two hours. Although, in this case, the two hour limit is pretty trivially satisfied since the crossing times of Davar and Sentinel 2 are so close. So we'll say if they image the same spot on um, on Earth on the same day, that's a crossover. Now I needed to get polygon AOIs, so I took the raster CDL and I polygonized it by taking contiguous crop regions and then restricting to those that had at least 45 square kilometers of area. And for the sake of that contiguous, it doesn't matter what type of crop it is. I was just trying to find very crop full areas. And then 
due to limited processing time before this conference, I just looked at California. When I polygonize the CDL over California, it's almost entirely the Sacramento Valley that one gets, that giant green polygon. Although you can see others, there's a little polygon for Napa, there's Imperial Valley in the lower right, and others. So uh, here's an example crossover. Um, the DevR image is, um, this, this is 1057, one of the DevRs. And you can see on the map, it's that little gray rectangle. That's what this is a picture of. These are UTM tiles, which turn out to be a useful um, unit of analysis for us because then we can index and track the behavior of crossovers over a specific tile. But a tile is 25 kilometers by 25 kilometers, and generally um, we are interested in a finer type of sampling. So we've broken it down into 100 subtiles 10 across, 10 down, you can imagine the grid. And I've taken one of those, and I've blown up the 1057 image and the Sentinel-2B image for that subtile. Also, um, the only pixels that are shown are the ones that have passed an NDVI filter. So at this stage, I'm not actually using the CDL anymore. I want to in future work, but at this stage, I'm just trying to find the crops by filtering for a, a high enough NDVI, which is imperfect. As you can see, it looks like some water, perhaps some structures in the upper right ended up getting included um, past the filter, although I don't believe those are going to affect the analysis for reasons that I'll explain in a bit. So um, these are also, for the sake of comparison, both sampled to 4 meters GSD. The planet tile was at around 3 meters. Uh, the Sentinel was at around 10, I guess, 10. Um, that, that choice of resampling is not carefully made, and I haven't studied what effect different strategies would make in terms of the results. So that, that is something for future work. But I am just showing what the CDL looks like here, just so that one can get an idea of it. So this is the 2018 CDL, and the images are from 2019, from May. But we can reasonably infer that the type of crop that we're looking at here is grapes, be, because I'm just assuming that it would be grapes again. Um, and there's also some, some grass area that it turned out didn't get past the NDVI filter. The type of comparison that I'm doing for one of these subtiles is designed to produce for each band one data point. Uh, initially, when I got to Planet, we were just taking the mean value for one tile and the mean value for the other tile and, com and comparing the two means. But I think it's a little bit more robust to look at the density scatter plot and um, find the densest part of the density scatter plot of pixel to pixel values. So I fit a Gaussian to the histogram peak. You, you kind of have to imagine that the denser, like the purple and blue, is the denser part. And so you can imagine that that is the higher part of the third dimension of the histogram that's coming out towards you. So then if you fit a Gaussian to that peak, um, you can find the densest location, which I call uh, the mode, although it isn't truly the mode because it's not actually, uh, there isn't necessarily, um, it isn't necessarily the most frequent x, y values, it's just the densest part. So uh, in this example, the Sentinel values are on the y-axis. 
the Davar values are on the x-axis, and these are the raw values from the image. So that's why uh, the Sentinel-2b, is its mode is around 1500, but when one applies the given coefficient to convert to radiance, one gets 65.8 watts per uh, stradian per micrometer per meter squared. Uh, compared to the Dove, which is in units of 100 times watts, so that's 63.6, which is encouraging. Although, um, one thing to note is that the, the pointing of the blob, it doesn't really appear to be quite pointing through zero, zero. And this is something that Min Su showed yesterday, that when one looks at these scattergrams, one usually observes some sort of intercept. So in this case, it looks like there is an intercept that would almost pass through like 1,000 dNs on the dove axis, on the x-axis, about which uh, more in a bit. So the idea of this fitting to the mode is to try, try to be resistant to, um, to pixels that are not really the dominant feature in the image. So if, if there were, say, a cloud in one image and not in the other, then that would be you know, part of the nebula of pixels that aren't actually, um, that aren't actually the densest part. So they just get completely ignored. So for a crossover event, for a given coincidence of swaths and for all of the images that one derives from that, and for all of the subtiles in those, I get a point for each subtile. For this specific crossover event, of which I've just showed one tile, there were 2,000 points derived, which I've plotted here. So this is just one point in this. And you can begin to see much more clearly that the lines there are the one-to-one -one lines, and I've converted to radiance. I apologize for the, the smallness of the axes labels, but um, Sentinel-2b is now on the x-axis, 1057 is now on the y-axis, and, um, wow, it's even too small for me to see in here. Thank you. So, uh, in the lower left plot, which is the comparison of red bands, the center of that blob on the x-axis is at 50 watts around, and that's the dimmest one. Um, for blue, it's around 60 watts. For green, it's also around 60. And then for near, it's up around 80. That's the, the center. And you can see now that that at least red, green, and blue are showing noticeable positive y-intercepts, positive dove intercepts. Here I've plotted all of the crossover events for 1057 versus either Sentinel over California polygons that I've found over the lifetime of 1057. So that's 12 events that managed to pass the filters um, in terms of close enough in time, uh, good enough image quality, and then uh, 6,500 subtiles that managed to have enough usable data. Like after the NDVI filter, I then uh, say there have to be a certain number of pixels for it to be usable. So there's the 6,500 points plotted in each of those. One thing to note is uh, this clustering. It's most noticeable in um, blue, green, and near, the lower right, where you can almost see kind of bimodal behavior. It's not just bimodal, though. It's really um, different crossover events contribute these streaks. And it's like the streaks can have different intercepts, which presumably relates to different stray light conditions, perhaps, associated with a given event. So it's, it's not that um, different satellites have uh, this different behavior with respect to the intercepts. Even within just one satellite, there's different behavior at different locations and times. And in fitting, this clustering needs to be uh, taken care of, uh, or else one can get very misleading results. 
And now here's all of the data for all Davar. So that's 120,000 points plotted. And, uh, and the, the width of the scatter is very noticeable now, which is the accumulation of all of those different intercepts for all of the, of the different events. Uh, here are counts of the crossover events, just showing that they get more and more frequent towards May and June. Interestingly, um, it dropped off in July, and that's not because I interrupted the data collection midway through July. That's through to the end of July. So um, I guess there was just less usable data, fewer crossovers. I, I'm not sure why yet. So in, an in analyzing the data, I use a hierarchical linear model. And the reason for that is that it accounts for that within event clustering. So if you imagine that you had, um, if you had a, a crossover event, a streak or a blob that was positively offset, and for some reason it happened to have 300 points, and then you had one that looked like it was truer, um, without as much of a spurious offset, but it had fewer points, then the larger cluster would contribute disproportionately. But those data points are correlated with each other. They're not all telling you independent pieces of information. So to account for that, I use a random intercept model to effectively um, align all of the blobs down to each other, allowing for the fact, uh, assuming a Gaussian error model for their intercept. And uh, there are other terms there. There's a term that correlates the, the magnitude of the positive intercept of a cluster with the event mean radiance, so with the x value, which is, uh, which is necessary for doing good statistics. But it also makes physical sense, because if, the, if these intercepts are caused by, say, ambient light somehow getting in and, um, and causing stray light in the image, then it would make sense that brighter images or uh, images over um, lighter land would contribute more of an intercept. So you tend to see this kind of like echelon formation where there will be like one blob and then another blob sitting on top of it like that, and then another one sitting on top of it like that which you can kind of see happening in the near. Also, all of the sets are put together and fit within the same model, which is useful because then the flock mean can be used as a prior for fitting each of the sets, um, which is important because of the amount of um, sampling error that we tend to get for the different sets, and the fact that some sets, just by chance, tend to get way more crossover events than others, just by luck. So um, regular regularizing the different sets slopes to the flock mean serves to decrease the, um, the variance of the predictions. So um, I'm also just going to describe the data without fitting in a, in a bit. But, but uh, fitting helps me break it down by, um, by site and location. And it helps me look into what might be the cause of these spurious intercepts so that at some point we can model them and uh, fix them. So just fitting practically ordinary least squares, if one were to do that to all of the points of Davar versus Sentinel, one would see that uh, it's on average 13% high in the blue, that's the 1.13, and then you know 11% high in the green, 19% in the red. Of course, that's a little bit, um, it's a little bit misleading because these are not necessarily multiplicative errors. It's not that like I could just multiply the dove red values by 0.8 and then have everything be fixed. There's additive errors and there's um, non-Gaussian errors. Plotting all of the individual satellites fits together 
one can at least see that the dev r are relatively consistent with each other. Um, so that's, that's indicating that the slopes of the 25 satellites are 1.13 plus or minus 0.05 in the blue, for instance. This breaks down the relative error of planet versus Sentinel-2 versus the Sentinel-2 radiance. So it's showing that the relative error is highest at lower radiances, which is intuitively obvious. Um, and the y-axis here are not at the same scale. And again, I apologize for the fact that these labels are so small. Um, and get the axes. Thank you. So in blue, one can see that uh, the, the series starts around 25 watts of Sentinel in the x-axis, and it's at 50% high. So planet is 50% higher than Sentinel at that level. Um, for red, uh, it, um, the first line above the zero is 100% high. The lines that you see, the darker lines, are the median lines. Then there's a blob that is the 25th to 75th percentile. And then the lighter one is the 5th to 95th percentile of values. OK, so this is a work in progress. I have more work to do on this. Um, so I've conducted this study using the CDL to find crossovers between DevR and Sentinel-2. And it allows us to say something about the errors in DevR's top of atmosphere radiance. Um, I've only looked at California so far. In the future, I'd like to correlate the results with the specific crops uh, so that we can see, is there perhaps a specific crop that we're doing better on or worse on, which might give us a clue why. And I'm also going to extend this to all of the other planet sats, not just of our. And then we want to automate this so that it will just provide regular feedback so that it'll just produce a report and tell us, this is how we're doing with all of the crossovers. This is how we're doing at different radiance levels. This is our distribution of errors. Oh, and yeah, shout out again to Cropscape. It's really good. So I got to connect with the people who made that. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Joss. Uh, I think we need to move on. We're running a little bit late. Uh, questions after the session. Uh, so next up is Aaron. All right, uh, so next up is Aaron Jumpersuit from Planet. Um, thank you. Um, I'll try and make this quick because it's the last one before lunch. Um, so my name is Aaron Jumpersuit. I'm from Planet, and uh, I, I'm going to describe a study I was doing earlier this year about interoperability between uh, some new DevR satellites and the, the um, older Dove Classic ones. So... Um, uh, as I'm sure you've heard before from previous presentations, Planet has over 100 calibrated satellites in SSO. Um, currently, the majority of these are the two-stripe Dove satellites, which in this talk I refer to as Dove Classic. Um, but 
in December of last year, we launched um, 25 of these new uh, DAVAR satellites, which, act, which have four, uh, four homogeneous stripes instead of two stripes. Um, and so, yeah, um, this talk, I'll talk about um, a study um, using simultaneous crossovers between the two. And this is all d done on um, L1 level data, so top of atmosphere reflectance. And one of the aims was to try and create um, a kind of harmonization transform so that when we start delivering Davar um, imagery, which I think is now, um, to customers, it could help um, when they try and mix it with Dove Classic data as well. So um, just a brief description of the sensors for the Dove Classic um, versus the Davar. Um, the top stripe is an RGB uh, Bay array, and the bottom stripe has, um, uh, contains all the near pixels. And um, we actually use the author-rectification process to try and to composite the, the RGB stripe on the near stripe together. Um, and um, this is a typical RSR from a Dove Classic. You can see that it um, has quite broad and Gaussian bands for each of the um, uh, red, green, and blue bands. And uh, also the near band is quite wide as well. So this is the sensor layout for our new um, Davars. Uh, there are four uh, homogeneous bands. So each of these um, stripes have uh, a single contain a single band. Uh, so there's no um, uh, short array or anything. Um, and there's a there's actually a new structure from motion pipeline which um, composites. Uh, each of these four bands into the entire frame of the sensor, so that um, we can actually, so we can compare this uh, frame together. Um, uh, the filters themselves share the Sentinel-2 heritage, so they, they, uh, the transmissions are, are almost identical to Sentinel-2, <coughs> um, but only for four bands currently. Uh, so moving on quickly. Um, uh, for this uh, study, I defined a couple of large AOIs for within which to look for crossovers. Um, I chose um, some agricultural sites in the north and southern hemisphere so that um, I could try and catch uh, the growing season in both. Um, I used the standard pseudo-invariant calibration sites which Josh uh, mentioned earlier. And I also chose a couple of urban sites to try and just so that I can try and get a variation of the types of terrain and data contained within the data set. Uh, so this is just an illustration of the, some of the AOIs chosen, uh, the Northern Agricultural ones, uh, Midwest America, and uh, Imperial Valley in California, um, some of the calibration sites in uh, North Africa, and uh, LA and uh, the UAE as uh, some urban sites. And uh, I also chose uh, New Zealand and uh, the eastern part of Australia and around Johannesburg in South Africa as a southern kind of agricultural um, AOI. Um, the time of interest for the study was from, from launch, so Decem um, December 2018, until um, around mid-March uh, 2019. So it's not the most up-to-date data, but work is going on to update this with more data. Um, as I mentioned, we chose both uh, ag northern and southern agricultural sites so that we can try and, because we found that northern uh, agricultural sites are actually snow mostly and not agriculture. Uh, so we tried to catch um, some agriculture in, in the southern one. Uh, as Josh mentioned, um, we define uh, a crossover as uh, an imaging event over the same point of Earth with a maximum of two hour time difference. Um, and <coughs> since both of these constellations are primarily nadir imaging, the view angles weren't really um, an issue. Um, this analysis was done at 30 meters, and um, in total there were about 250 crossover events. And this is just a timeline of the crossover events um, uh, separated out by the AOI. Um, they're fairly roughly evenly divided over the time. Um, some of them had um, more crossover events than others, but um, yeah, it, it was, we tried to be fairly even. 
And uh, looking at the time difference between the two um, image events, uh, the Davars actually have a couple of different orbits, and so do the Dove Classics, so, um, which explains some of the variation. But um, on the whole, um, most of the uh, crossover events were um, within one hour of each other. So there will be some ver atmospheric variation, um, but we hope to mi minimize it. Um, this table, which is probably not very clear, um, shows a summary of, like, uh, of the crossover events uh, in total that was used. <coughs> so at the top, there's the, um, the each of the Davar satellites. And this is uh, on the y-axis is um, all of the Dove Classic satellites involved. So you can see that it's, it, it wasn't too clustered around any kind of single pair of satellites. It was spread fairly evenly over the two constellations, which were, we hope were, were made the data set um, better for analysis. Um, so in addition to looking at just the Dove Classic and Dove R uh, crossovers, we, actu um, we actually used some um, additional data sets to try and for this analysis, which I'll go into later. Um, but we have um, in total about five different data sets. So there's Dove Classic um, only crossovers, which are a crossover event involving two Dove Classics. Dove R only, which is the same with just two Dove R satellites. And then we also f found the Dove um, Classic and uh, Davar with Sentinel-2 uh, crossovers independently. So um, in addition to the Davar, Dove Classic crossovers, there's um, these four additional data sets. Um, and we, um, at the moment, we're only look into the, uh, the, the looking into the fit of the crossover events. Um, so um, we, we didn't look into the offset or anything yet. Um, and I'll show you what I mean by fit in the next slide. So. Um, each of these crossover tiles, um, on the top there's a Dove Classic and Dove R um, crossover event, and, on, and the bottom row shows a, the Dove Classic, Dove Classic equivalent for the same day on the same area. And um, what we mean by fit is that just the uh, robust fit, uh, linear fit of the, uh, to the data, um, and uh, how good it is. Um, Ideally, if it, would, if, if it was um, a very good fit, there would be one, but um, generally, they're not quite one. Um, yeah, and we felt the data set uh, uh, to try and get rid of as many of the uh, crossovers that have um, cloud events as well. So again, this is a similar kind of a comparison with the bottom being uh, the Davar, Davar um, crossover event for this, for this tile. And um, again, this is the Davar Sentinel on the bottom to show the differences um, in that crossover and Dove Classic and Sentinel. So you can see the variation of the five data sets, which hopefully were fairly matched. So uh, on to the analysis. Um, so the primar primary analysis was between three different groups of the fits. So we chose. Um, as a kind of control, the Dove Classic uh, only crossovers and the Dove R only crossovers, um, to uh, since we expected them to be um, very homogeneous. But then um, we looked into the difference, the statistical differences between those two data sets and the Dove R and Dove Classic crossover data set. Um, uh, and so uh, this data set, the Dove R, Dove Classic data set, is actually a slightly a, a subset of the entire data set. And only, and only the events which have an associated Dove Classic or Dove R crossover event were, were, is shown. Um, so uh, as, a, as a statistical tool, we use the ANOVA analysis of variance test to check whether, to see whether there's any statistical differences between the groups. And for blue, and uh, you can kind of see it from the graph as well, um, the, the dot is the mean of, the, of this group, and the, the lines indicate the standard deviation. Um, you can see that they are very similar. The Dove Classic, Dove R, and Dove Classic, and Dove R only <coughs> groups are all quite similar. 
but you can see that for the green um, and red and the near bands, the, the Dovar and Dove Classic uh, crossover events actually stick out a little bit compared to the Dovar only and the Dove Classic only. And um, the, st the statistical tests bear this out as well. Um, so um, what we did was we looked at the Sentinel-2 crossovers as well as a kind of independent data set uh, with which to, um, to, to create a correction factor from. So what we did um, with this data set is that we actually um, just corrected everything um, uh, to the Sentinel-2. Uh, so we just basically um, found correction factors to Sentinel-2. But then, in order to convert this into a Davar, Dov classic correction <coughs> factor, we um, divided them, we essentially just combined them and <coughs> essentially divided out the Sentinel-2 factors so that we can get some Dov classic to Davar correction factors. Um, um, and so this is just showing the effect of, uh, of fitting uh, everything to the Sentinel-2 data set. Um, uh, and you can see that uh, obviously everything just has a mean of zero now um, because we forced that to happen. And then, but when you apply these correction factors to the original data set, you can see that um, it improves the, uh, the kind of um, homogeneity between the two uh, a little bit. So uh, rerunning the uh, ANOVA test, uh, it indicates that there's no statistical difference between the Dove Classic uh, only crossovers the Dava and Dove Classic crossovers and the Dava only crossovers for any of the bands, which is um, which is good. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, we that was a subset of the um, data set uh, where only the Dava Dove Classic um, crossovers with an uh, associ with an associated Dove Classic and Dava only crossover event was was shown, but. If you look at the entire data set, this is before correction, um, and this is after correction. And again, you can see some kind of uh, Im gross improvement to the fits. Uh, so it's kind of a rough correction factor. Um, so <laughs> in conclusion, uh, I just this is a work in progress, a, a summary of how uh, of the studies uh, we performed so far of the crossovers between Dove Classics and Dove Rs. Um, so these are kind of preliminary harmonization factors uh, which uh, we derived for, for now. Um, they don't take any of the scene content into account or, or, or spatial content. And only we are only looking at the fits and uh, of, the, of the corrections. And we don't actually look into the offset or anything yet. So now we're just um, extending this to look into um, effect on the offset of the fit as well, and um, looking at more recent data. And um, these are just some examples of, of the effect um, and, the, and the scatter graph. And generally, the scatter graph does move towards the one-to-one -one line, which is good. Um, so yeah, that's everything. <laughs>